Hello and welcome. Today we are going to talk about Europe nutrition and food customs. And the person who is talking to you is actually a community nutritionist and registered dietitian. My name is Agata Kowalewska and I work at the University of Florida and my home department is Center for European Studies. Center for European Studies uh, is a hub for everything Europe related. Therefore, we have a number of faculties who look at Europe from different perspectives. And my perspective, because I'm a nutritionist and dietitian, relates to food. So how can we look at Europe and food? We we may have traveled to Europe and ate in different countries, or may have read about this. We read a blogs, we are planning for next year, long trips and long vacations. And each of us has particular perspective. When I go to a particular country, other than seeing the historical sites, I also like to look at what people are eating and why are they eating certain things. So, for example, if we are looking at the Central and Eastern Europe, the main meals, the way how people ate, is very much carbohydrate and protein focus. So what does it mean? What are the carbohydrates? Carbohydrates are potatoes, it's wheat, it's barley, it's rye. So there are breads and buns and dumplings, and of course, potato. So not only Irish are known for eating the potatoes, but also people from Central and Eastern Europe. Actually, the soils of Central and Eastern Europe support growing potatoes. The potatoes like soils that are not very dense. They are, there is a lot of sand mixed into it. So the, the potato by itself has a space to grow. The other interesting thing about this part of, of Europe is that they are particularly Central and um, Eastern Europeans. Are, they are not really well known for having spicy food or adding many different uh, flavorings to it. But two of the ingredients that are very often showing up in, in the dishes as a flavoring agents are parsley, primarily flat leaf parsley, and dill. So both of them are um, you know, fragile herbs. They grow during the vegetative season, which is in, in many of this country from about June until maybe a little bit earlier. Some of them start growing in May till about end of August, September. After that, the winter comes in, frost and the herbs are killed. So um, we have a vegetative season when those herbs are used fresh and then they can be used later uh, since uh, you know uh, refrigeration and freezers became common those herbs can be frozen but before that they were used as dry herbs similar that you know you can buy it in the store dry rosemary dry basil the same way you can use dry paper um, flakes of parsley or dill so we we are looking at diet that provides proteins from meats and carbohydrates from wheat, potatoes, and barley. So it is traditional diet is not extremely um, diverse. And there's really not many sources of, of vitamins from fruits and fresh vegetables outside of uh, growing season or harvest season. So uh, looking at the traditional diet, we have to now consider what are the recommendations of what people should be eating. So European Union as a whole has a recommendation for how the members or people who live in member states should be eating. Each one of the countries that are you know, part of European Union or outside of European Union, but still in Europe, also have their recommendations. Uh, we're not going to go through all of them because this is a mini lesson about Europe and food customs. But 
some of the highlights are all, all the recommendations um, focus on having a diverse diet, so eating different foods from all the food groups. And the food groups are fruits, vegetables, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Um, all the recommendations uh, talk about eating foods, uh, fruits and vegetables. So what we what we can gather from it is that regardless if this is a general recommendation that comes from the EU or it is a recommendation that comes from the um, member states, they, they all focus on colors diversity. Uh, we, there is an abbreviation in the title of the slide. It's FBDG. And what does this mean? This means food-based dietary guidelines. Uh, because we eat food, we don't eat nutrients. When, when the recommendations are made to general populations, they use food as base of improving health through nutrition. They don't use nutrients. Because if somebody tells you eat vitamin C or vitamin A, it doesn't mean anything. So what are the foods that actually contain vitamin A and vitamin C? So since I already talked about those two vitamins, uh, I want to also talk, tell you about the, the recommendation. Those two vitamins are very crucial in human health. So if you look across different recommendations within the European Union or outside of European Union, is they are also part of what people should be eating, foods that contain a lot of vitamin A and a lot of vitamin C. Why? why there's such a specific recommendation. So vitamin A, which is also known as retinol, is very important in a couple of uh, health uh, or not health customs, that, that's not the uh, good word, but in, in development of health or, or prolonging the health of humans. So uh, retinol or vitamin A is very important for vision and one of the tell signs of deficiency of vitamin A is when a person cannot see at dusk. So the, um, if the light is limited, person who has vitamin A deficiency may have problem at seeing. The other thing is that vitamin A is very important in gene expressions. So when our cells need to uh, differentiate and grow and build the organs, skin, bones, they need to know how they need to uh, propagate. And that's where vitamin A is very crucial. Uh, the next vitamin, vitamin C, has very different properties in the body, but they are also extremely important. So you probably all heard of, about vitamin C being important when we have cold or flu, to have diet that, that provides a lot of vitamin C and it will shorten the time of us being sick. But there are other functions of vitamin C that are as important. So when we when we are healing the wounds, when we are building the bones, when we are building the skin, wherever there is a connective tissue, vitamin C is important because vitamin C is part of the structure of building uh, that connective tissue. The other place is our health, our general health. Vitamin C is antioxidant, which means it protects us from different types of pollutants and protects our cells from mutating. It helps them to reproduce in the same way how the original cell was intended to be. So it, it, it provides the barrier from um, environmental pollutants or from the reactive species that are created in our body during regular metabolic processes. So, uh, to summarize, we have the recommendation to eat a lot of foods that have vitamin A and vitamin C, but we are in part of the Europe where the diet is a bit 
on the meat and potato side, not necessarily on the side of fresh fruits and vegetables that provide those vitamins. So how do Central Europeans deal with the problem? So this, this is a revelation, a little revelation of dill and parsley and the herbs that have been used in this part of the world for centuries. When you look at vitamins, so when you think about vitamin C, the first thing that comes to you is probably if you want to have vitamin C, you probably should eat a lot of lemon and citrus fruit, which in Florida is not a problem, of course, because we are growing citrus in Florida. But when you think about Central Europe, this is not a climate for growing citrus fruit. So how do people deal with need for vitamin C? Uh, C and for vitamin A. Uh, on the slide, you have the numerical values, which may slightly vary depending what type of lemon or what type of parsley or dill you are using. But generally, lemons do have a lot of vitamin C, but they don't have vitamin A. So even if Europeans were able to grow them, this is really doesn't solve all the problems. It doesn't, give, doesn't provide the, all the vitamins that they need to have in the um, needed quantities. However, parsley and dill may be a surprise. They do have quite a bit of, bit of vitamin C and they also provide vitamin A. So actually, when you compare the the amount of lemon that you will have to eat, it is much more than what you will have to eat using dill or parsley and get the same or even more of vitamin C. And in addition to vitamin C, also vitamin A. So dill and lemon are very often used as a garnish or as a, um, so a flavorant. To, to many of the Central and Eastern European dishes. But there is a definite nutritional advantage of using those little springs of greenery on the side of the plate and actually eating them. So even though the climate of Central Europe does not allow for growing citrus fruit, because they do grow dill and they do grow parsley, they can uh, follow their recommendation and their health benefits from eating little sprink of parsley or dill with their meals. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this short lecture about European food customs and nutrition. For more information, please visit um, our website and follow us on Twitter and also read information that are provided in the description of the slide. Until the next time, thank you.